So let's start off by talking about what credit derivatives are. Credit derivatives help protect against credit risk. The biggest buyers of credit derivatives are banks and the biggest sellers are insurance companies. There are two types of credit derivatives, single names, for example, credit default swaps, and multi-name, example, collateralized debt obligation. So now, instead of waiting around and hoping for the best, once assuming a credit risk, buyers and sellers are able to insure themselves against this risk through credit derivatives. Credit default swaps are the most popular credit derivative. They provide insurance against the risk of default, and the payoff goes from the seller of the protection to the buyer of the protection, and occurs if the specified entity, meaning the company or the country, defaults on its obligations. When dealing with credit default swaps, we refer to the company as the reference entity and the default by the company as a credit event. The buyer obtains the right to sell bonds issued by the company for their face value when the credit event occurs, and the seller agrees to buy these bonds for their face value when the credit event occurs. Credit default swaps notional principle is the total face value of the bonds that can be sold. Periodic payments from buyer to seller occur either for the life of the CDS or until a credit event occurs, and these payments are normally paid every quarter and every year. It is also possible for deals to be made where these payments are paid every month, every six months, or 12 months. And these payments can be made in advance instead of in arrears. Contracts with maturity of five years are the most popular, but there are other maturities such as one, two, three, seven, and 10 years, and they are not uncommon. Usually these contracts mature on one of the following standard dates, March 20th, June 20th, September 20th, and December 20th. Settlement in the event of default involves either physical delivery of the bonds or a cash payment. We are now going to look at an example that will help illustrate how a typical deal is structured. So two parties enter into a CDS on March 20th, 2012. We're going to assume that the notional principal is $100 million. The buyer agrees to pay 90 basis points per annum, and there are quarterly payments in arrears. If no credit event occurs, the buyer receives no payoff and pays 22.5 basis points, which would be 25% of 90 on $100 million. So 0 0.00225 times the $100 million is equal to $225,000. And this would be paid on June 20th, 2012, and every quarter thereafter until March 20th, 2017. If a credit event occurs, a substantial payoff is likely. So let's suppose that there's a default on May 20th, 2015. If there's a physical settlement, the buyer has the right to sell bonds issued by the reference entity with a face value of $100 million, $400 million on June 20th, 2015. If a cash settlement is used, which is the most common, an ISDA organized auction process determines mid-market value of the cheapest deliverable bond several days after the credit event. So an example would be that the auction indicates that the bond is worth $35 per $100 of face value, and the cash payoff would be $65 million. It's important to note that the regular quarterly payments from the buyer to the seller are going to cease when there is a credit event. However, these payments were made in arrears, and there's a final accrual payment that the buyer is usually required to make. So two months had passed between March 20th, 2015 and May 20th, 2015. And so there's a final payment of approximately $150,000 that the buyer will need to pay, but no further payments would be required after that. That $150,000 comes from approximately two-thirds or two out of the three months of the 225000 monthly payments. In a collateralized debt obligation, which is a multi-name credit derivative, a portfolio of debt instruments, meaning corporate bonds or commercial loans, is specified. Cash flows from the portfolio to different categories of investors and securities with high and low credit ratings are created from this portfolio. Let's look at another example. Suppose that an investor buys a five-year corporate bond yielding 7% per year for its face value. At the same time, this investor enters into a five-year CDS to buy protection against the issuer of the bond defaulting. 
The CDS spread is 200 basis points per annum. If the issuer of the bond does not default, the investor earns 5% per year when the CDS spread is netted against the corporate bond yield. But if it does default, the investor earns 5% up to the time of the default, then is able to exchange the bond for its face value. This face value can be invested at the risk-free rate for the remainder of the five years. The CDS bond basis is equal to the CDS spread minus the asset swap spread. And the asset swap spread is the excess of bond yield over risk-free rate. The recovery rate is the value of the bond immediately after default as a percent of face value. Let's look at the assumptions for our next example. So we're going to assume that defaults always happen halfway through a year. Also, payments on the credit default swap are made once a year at the end of the year. The risk-free LIBOR interest rate is 5% per annum with continuous compounding. The recovery rate is 40%. Payments are made at a rate of S per year, and the notional principal is $1. An unconditional default probability is a default probability as seen at time zero. The probability of a default during the first year is 0.02, and the probability that the reference energy will survive until the end of the first year is 0.98. The default probability of year three is 0.0192, and we get that by multiplying 0.02, the default probability of year one, by 0.0196 the default probability of year two. The survival probability of year three is 0.9412, and we get that by multiplying the survival probability of year two, 0.9604, by the survival probability of year one, 0.98. Table 24.2 shows us how to calculate the present value of expected payments. So looking at year three to get the present value of expected payments, we take the expected payment, which is 0.9412S, and multiply it by E to the negative 0.05 times 3, 3 being how many years, and 0.05 because of the interest rate that we were given in assumptions, and that is equal to 0.8101S. Table 24.3 shows us the calculation of the present value of expected payoff. So looking at year 2.5. To get the expected payoff, we take the probability of default, which is 0 0.0192, and we multiply it by 1 minus the recovery rate, which would be 0 0.6. That times 1 is equal to 0 0.0115. Now to get the present value of expected payoff in dollars, we take the expected payoff, which is 0 0.0115 that we just found, multiply it by e to the negative 0 0.05 times 2.5, 2.5 being the time, and that is equal to 0 0.0102. Finally, table 24.4 shows us the calculation of present value of accrual payment. This table considers the accrual payment made in the event of a default. So for example, there is a 0 0.0192 probability that there will be a final accrual payment halfway through the third year. The accrual payment is 0.5s. And that is what we will be using for our calculation of expected accrual payment. Now to get the present value of the expected accrual payment, we take that number, which is 0.0096s, and multiply it by e to the negative 0 0.05 times 2.5, which equals 0 0.0085s. To calculate the present value of the expected payments, we take the total present value of expected payments, which is 4.0704s, and we add the total present value of expected accrual payments, which is 0.0426s, and together, that is equal to 4.1130s. The present value of the expected payoff is equal to 0.0511. If we equate those, you get 4.1130s is equal to 0.0511 and s is equal to 0.0124. If we were to do this problem in derivative, the hazard rate 
which is continuously compounded, should be input as 2.02% for all maturities. The term structure is flat at 5% and the recovery rate is 40%. Like most other swaps, CDSs are marked to market daily. They may have a positive or a negative value. Suppose in our example, the CDS had been negotiated for a spread of 150 basis points. The present value of payments would then be 4.1130 times the 0 0.0150, which comes from the 150 basis points, and that equals 0 0.0617. The present value of payoff is 0 0.0511, so the value of swap to the seller would be equal to 0 0.0617 minus 0 0.0511, and that equals 0 0.0106 times the principal. The mark-to-market value of the swap to the buyer of the protection would be negative 0 0.0106 times the principal. The default probabilities used to value a CDS should be risk-neutral and not real-world. Risk-neutral default probabilities can be estimated from bond prices or asset swaps, but an alternative is to imply them from CDS quotes. Binary credit default swaps are structured similarly to a regular credit default swap, except that the payoff is a fixed dollar amount. Probabilities of default are approximately proportional to 1 over 1 minus r, but the payoffs from the binary CDSs are independent of r, which sets them apart from normal CDSs. To follow the performance of the credit default swaps, the market has created several credit indices of which the most popular are the CDS, a portfolio of 125 investments in North America, and the iTrust Europe, a portfolio of 125 investments in Europe. They are used primarily to gain information of the credit default swaps market and also to hedge against the credit risk associated with the companies that are included in these indices. For example, assume that the offer of the 5-year CDS index is current 66 basis points and also that the trader wants $800,000 of protection in each company. The total cost is therefore the basis points times the amount of protection required in each company times the number of companies in the units, or $660,000 per year. In this scenario, if a company defaults, the trader receives the usual credit defaults was payoff, and the annual payment uh, of the, for the protection is reduced by the amount of protection required by that company. But one of the main problems of the credit default swaps is that they are complex. So in order to reduce that complexity, there are certain credit default swaps that use fixed coupons. That in the end makes the CDS behave like a bond. So at the beginning of the contract, a price is calculated using certain data of the credit default swap market. And the difference between the notional principal and the price is paid by one of the parties at the beginning of the contract. And after that, a coupon times the notional principal is paid by the buyer protection on each payment day. So the regular payments made by the buyer protection are independent of the spread. And that is the main factor why this instrument is more simple than the usual CDS. Furthermore, in the credit derivatives market also exists forward and options on credit default swaps. So first of all, a CDS forward is the obligation to buy or sell a particular CDS at a particular future time t. And a CDS option is an option to buy or sell a particular CDS at a particular future time t. So if you think about it, it just the regular definitions of a forward and an option just apply to a CDS. But the main difference between these CDS forwards and CDS options and the regular forwards and options are that these are usually structured so that they cease to exist if the reference entity defaults before the maturity of the instrument. Another instrument is a basket credit default swap. And that simply is a group of different credit default swaps. So there are various types. The first is an added basket in which a payment is made each time an entity of the basket defaults. The second is the first to default basket in which only one payment is made when the first entity defaults. The third is the second to default basket in which only one payment is made at the second default. And in an analogous way, the K to default basket can be defined. On the other hand, another instrument is a total return swap. 
in which there are two parties. One is the payer and the other is the receiver. The payer has to pay a total return on assets. It can be bonds, it can be stocks or whatever. And the receiver has to pay a LIBOR plus the spread. Uh, so for example, it can be used to transfer the clear risk of a bond or the return of, of investment in stocks from the payer to the receiver. So for example, consider the situation. The receiver wants $100 million to invest in a bond. Therefore, the payer and the receiver enters into a total return swap and the payer buys the bond. So as you can see in the slide, it is like the receiver had borrowed money at LIBOR plus 25 basis points to buy the bond. And in this case, if the, if the receiver defaults on the LIBOR plus 25 basis points, the payer has the overshoot of the bond as collateral. So he still can get some money by the return of the bond. The next instrument is called collateral debt obligations or CDOs. As was said previously, it is a debt obligation instrument in which the risk is distributed in a waterfall structure. So as you can see in the image, the, the CDO is divided in several tranches and the cash flows from the from the access go first to the, the upper tranches of the structure and lastly to the lower tranches of the structure. So as you can imagine, the upper tranches are the less risky of the instrument and the lower tranches are the more risky. So the upper tranches can be rated as triple A and the lower tranches can be rated as triple C or B. And there are two types of CDOs. One is called cash CDO and the other is synthetic CDO. A cash CDO is created from a bond portfolio, while the synthetic CDO is created from short positions in credit default swaps in which the reference entities could be the companies that issue the bond portfolio of the cash CDO. But contrary to the cash CDO in which an initial investment is required by finance the, to finance the, the underlying bonds, in a synthetic CDO, the holders of the synthetic CDOs do not have to make an initial investment, maybe only collateral. And also it is the portfolio or short CDOs doesn't need to exist. It can be used only as a conceptual reference point. Meanwhile, the cash CDO needs the, the bond portfolio to exist. That's the biggest difference between the two. So let's suppose that each reference entity has a 2% probability of default. If we had no correlation at all, then the probability of 10 frames defaulting would be 0.0034%. But then again, if we had perfect correlation, that would be the probability of 10, fir 10 firms defaulting would be 2%. Basically, if you have a correlation of one, that would mean that all firms are, all firms are the same. And then if one firm defaults, every other firm defaults. So here we have the magic of diversifying in the CDO. If we diversify the entities in the CDO, then we, have, we can lower the risk of the of the CDO exponentially. CDO, we have the expected tranche principal at time j, the present value of one dollar received at time j, and the spread on a particular tranche. For the present value of the expected regular spread payment s times a, where a would be this equation, which basically tells us how to get the tranche for tranche for the for the period we want to. So then we got the present value of the expected payoffs on the CDO. And this is assuming that the loss occurs at the midpoint of the time interval. And then we get the accrual payment due on the losses. Well, S times B, where B is, well, we calculated from this equation, the model of time to default. So we have the probability of default of every firm at time t conditional on the factor f, where well, we'll have the, the equation right here, where the probability of default of every firm is 1 minus e to the minus lambda t, where lambda is a parameter of hazard. And then we, we also have a rho, that's the couple of correlation, and we assume that it's the same for any pair of companies.
we also assume that all companies have the same probability of default. So given what I just said, we can calculate the probability of k defaults on time t, and that's given by the binomial distribution displayed right here. So I showed you earlier how to calculate the, the values for a, b, and c. But now we're gonna want to calculate the. But now we got the equations for a, b, and c conditional to f. So well, what we're gonna want to do is to integrate a, b, and c in order to get those values unconditional to f. So we assume that the variable f has a standard normal distribution. And once we integrate, what we're going to have is the, well, those values unconditional to f. And, and once those values have been calculated, the break-even spread on the trench can be calculated. That's what I showed you earlier. Well, the s would be c divided by a plus b, in which we can calculate the implied correlation. So first, there's the, there's the base correlation and the compound correlation. It, what the compound correlation basically does is calculate the, well, or adjust the model correlation so it fits the correlation of the market. In contrast, for the base correlation, we have to do uh, some steps to calculate. So for the base correlation, what the steps hold says, uh, first calculate the compound correlation for each trench. Then we have to calculate the present value of expected, uh, of expected loss for each trench. Sum these to get the present value of expected loss for base correlation trenches. And last, calculate the correlation parameter in one factor Gaussian couple model that is consistent with the expected loss. standard uh, market model. First, we're going to see the heterogeneous model. The standard market model is uh, homogeneous in the sense that the time to default probability distributions are assumed to be the same for all companies and the couple of correlations for any pair of companies are the same. In the heterogeneous model, the homogeneity of ass assumptions can be relaxed so that a more general model is used. This makes the implementation more complicated because each company has a different probability of defaulting by any given time. Also, uh, the probability of, to, of exactly k defaults by time t conditional on f that we can find in equation 25.7 can no longer be calculated using this model and it is necessary to use another kind of numerical procedure. Next is uh, another alternative is other couplets. Uh, the one factor Gaussian model that we have used is a particular model of correlations between times to default. But there are, are many other factor, one factor coupler models that have been proposed, like the student coupler, the palladium coupler, Archimedean coupler, Marshall Hawking coupler, and the double T coupler. That Cool and white show that a good fit to the market is obtained when f and the z i have certain t distributions with four degrees of freedom. Next is uh, random factor loadings. This is a model by Anderson and Sidenius where the couple like correlation is a function of, of f. When the couple like correlation increases, F decreases. This means that when the default rate is high, the default correlation is also high. Next is the implied coupler model. This is a coupler model that can be implied from market growth. Quotes. It, in its simplest ver version, as assumes that a certain average hazard rate applies to all companies in a portfolio over the life of a CDO. The average has, has a rate has a probability distribution that can be implied from the pricing of trenches. And the calculation of the implied copula is similar to calculating an implied probability distribution 
for a stock price from option prices. Next are the dynamic models. So far we have discussed static models. They model the average default environment over the life of the CDO. And for example, the model, the model constructed for a 5-year CDO is different from the model constructed for a 7-year CDO and so on. The dynamic models attempt to model the evolution of the loss on a portfolio through time. And there are three different types. First is the structural models. Uh, in these models, the uh, stochastic processes for the asset prices of many companies are modeled simultaneously and they have to be implemented with Monte Carlo simulation and calibration is therefore uh, very difficult. Next are the reduced form of models uh, where the hazard rates of companies are modeled and to build a re in a realistic amount of correlation it is necessary to assume that there are jumps in the hazard rates. And finally there, there are the top-down models where the total loss on a portfolio is modeled directly. These models, they don't consider what happens to individual companies. So in this chapter we have discussed the importance of credit derivatives and how can they be used to transfer credit risk from one company to another and to diversify credit risk by swapping one type of exposure for another. The CDS is a contract where one company buys insurance from another company against a third company defaulting on its obligation. The payoff of, the, of a CDS is usually the difference between the face value of a bond issued by the reference entity and its value immediately after a default. A forward credit default swap is an obligation to enter into a particular credit default swap on a particular date. A credit default swap option is a right to enter into a particular credit default swap on a particular date. Uh, both instruments cease to exist if the reference entity defaults before the date. Now a total return swap is an instrument where the total return on a portfolio of credit sensitive assets is exchanged for LIBOR plus a spread. In a CDO, a number of different securities are created from a portfolio of corporate bonds or commercial loans. There are rules for determining um, the credit losses, and the result of these rule rules is that securities with both very high and very low credit ratings are created from the portfolio. Synthetic CDOs creates a similar set of securities from credit default swaps. And the standard market model for pricing both a K, a K2 default CDS and tranches of a symmetric CDO is a one factor Gaussian coupola model for time to default. Now we're gonna solve some exercises and starting from with the problem 24.8. Suppose that the risk free zero curve is flat at 7% and with continuous compounding and that defaults can occur halfway through each year in a new 5-year credit default swap. Suppose that the recovery rate is 3% and the hazard rate is 3%. Estimate the credit default swap spread. Assume payments are made annually. The uh, first alternative to solve this problem is the derivative. First we have to transform the hazard rate that is 3% because it's continually compounded and it should be input in the derivative as 0 0.03045 for all maturities as we as you can see then the term structure is flat at seven percent like the problem says and the recovery rate is 30 percent you change the payment frequency it's one and you calculate it and the spread is 220.6 uh, basic points or 221 ba basic points. The other option to resolve this exercise is to use the steps uh, we saw in example 241, where we had to to find uh, several tables and and we we also could find the spread. First, we we find the unconditional default probabilities and the survival probabilities. 
the default probabilities uh, for uh, in in the problem set to be three three percent. That is a hazard probability. We then find uh, the the first survival probability that is just uh, one minus the hazard probability. Then to find the second survival probability, we multiply ninety seven percent times ninety seven percent, and we get a zero point ninety four oh nine. To find the second default probability, we just multiply the 3% times the 97% and it, we get 0.0291. By repeating this process, we can find the other default probabilities. And for, for the table 2, we find the calculation of the present value of expected payment. We use the survival probability, the expected payment is, is this every six months I think and we also find a discount factor that is very simple and the present value of the expected payments is as in the example where we use the expected payment times e to minus 0 0.07 that is the free rate that the problem give us times 2 that is the period that we are seeing and we get 0 0.81 then we need to find the present value of the expected payoff. It's the same as, as the example. You can see we only change the recovery rate and the probability of default. And the expected payoff we can find it the same way, multiplying the probability of default times one minus the recovery rate times uh, the time we want to see. And the present value uh, we use, for example, 0 0.19 times e to minus 0 0.07 that is the free rate of this problem times 2.5 that is the, the period we want to explore and we get 0 0.21658 we sum all of these we get the present value of the expected payoff that is 0 0.08 then we calculate the present value of the equal payment it's the same as the, as the example and we get it that it's 0 0.059 with this we can get the present value of the expected payments that is going to be the sum between the total present value of the expected payments plus the total present value of the expected accrual payment we get that is 3.7962 the present value of the expected payoff we, got, we found it in table 3 is 0 0.08377 we equal the present value of the expected payment with the present value of the expected payoff and solve for S. With this we get that S the spread is 0 0.022067 or 221 basis points. Now we're gonna solve problem 24.9. What is the value of the swap in problem 24.8 per dollar of national principal to the protection buyer if the credit default swap spread is 150 basis points? We have that the uh, present value of the expected payments is 3.7962. We multiply it by the basis points and we get the present value of the payment, that is 0 0.0569. The present value of the payoff remains the same as in table 3. Now we get the value of the swap to the buyer of protection, that is 0 0.08377 minus 0 0.0569. And we get the value of the swap to the buyer protection is 0 0.0269 per dollar of national principal. Finally, we're gonna solve problem 24.10. What is a credit default swap spread in problem 24.8 if it is a binary CDS? First, we have to remember that binary CDS is structured similarly to a regular credit default swap, except that the payoff is a fixed dollar amount. We're gonna suppose that in the problem we consider in tables 1 to 4, the payoff is $1 instead of 1 minus R dollars, and the swap spread is S. We have to replace the table 3 with this table. We calculate that calculates the present value of expected payoff from a binary credit default swap with principal $1. As you can see, it's the same, it is the same as table 3 except for the expected payoff that is going to be the same as the default during the year. We get the present value of the expected payoff the same way as in table 3 and we get that the present value of the expected payoff is going to be 0 0.11 instead of 0 0.8, 0 0.8.
Now we have that the present value of the expected payments remains the same, 3.7962, but now the present value of the expected payoff is 0 0.1967. We equal these two and solve for S, and we get that the spread is 315 basis points.